Hi everyone, Kinsley Scott here. I am a trout guide based out of Missoula, Montana, and I am, as of now, former <laughs> steelhead guide in Washington State. And today I'm here with Umqua, and we are going to do a live Q&A of all things caddis. So Russell provided fabulous, a fabulous video, video about five days ago on building a box and kind of rigging. So from here, we're going to take it and move more into the approach of things and talk maybe a little bit more about uh, the animation of caddis and some specific caddis hatches that we have. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Ask away. So I'll start out, though. I... I'd like to talk, oh, perfect. How to identify a caddis fly on the water? That's a great question. So caddis, you're going to look for, I would say on average, a bug outside of, let me put an asterisk here, two very specific types of caddis, which would be a traveling sedge caddis and an October caddis. Those are generally the two largest that you would ever see. So we'll just call general caddis patterns uh, about a size 16. And what you'll see is they're very, they look very similar to a moth. They're going to have a, almost a tent wing on them, so down wing, and they have two very large antennae off the front. Um, identification two, caddis are predominantly nocturnal. So you'll, you'll see them throughout the day on the banks in vegetation, branches, things like that. And come, you know, into the evening time, late evening, they really start to become more active. The adults do. So you'll see there it's very indicative of an evening hatch. Um, so that's kind of a great way to identify uh, caddis. Moth-like, downwing, too large antennae off the front. And they're very animated in their movement, meaning they're not... Um, on the water very still. So you'll see them skittering, flying in, in clouds, so to speak. Um, yes, there's a lot of movement with it. And for me here in Western Montana, I admittedly don't get to fish caddis as much as I would like to, but I am from the Missouri River, um, kind of east of the divide and in central Washington, or excuse me, Montana, and also fish a lot of caddis in central Washington on the Yakima. Um, I'll get more into my hatches here. I have another question. When you say animated, should we copy that and how we fish them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, and when I say animated, I, I, I wrote down a few terms here, you know, for fishing, you can skate skitter, twitch, uh, really give them a lot of movement. So yes, uh, if you see caddis and fish at 
actively feeding on the caddis that are kind of skating across the surface, um, yes, mimic that uh, in terms of fishing. And when you use caddis for salmon, I live on a lake, I live on Lake Superior, wondering if I could target them when they come up the rivers. Yes, absolutely. Um, salmon, much like steelhead, are anadromous, meaning they'll, they'll move. And please define skating perfect for the newbies. So I'll answer the salmon question and come back to the skating, the animation part of things. Um, could you use caddis for salmon? I live on Lake Superior, wondering if I could target them when they come up the rivers. Yes. So I'm assuming, and I'm not sure on time of the year, but uh, yes, you could absolutely use caddis to skate um, for anadromous fish, meaning moving fish, specifically salmon steelhead, um, fishing for steelhead on a skated October caddis in the Pacific Northwest is my favorite thing to do in the fall. So absolutely give it a try. Uh, I think that would be an absolute hoot uh, to get a salmon on a swung uh, caddis. So please define skating, et cetera, for newbies. Yeah, so certainly. So let me put it in terms of like the presentation, right? So dead drifting versus skating. Uh, this question comes up a lot when we're talking about fishing caddis flies. Do you want a dead drift or do you want a skated fly? And when, when do you know what to do? So let me define skating. Skating is going to be when your fly has fast movement across the surface of the water, sustained movement. Obviously a dead drift, we know that it's presenting our fly as if it is dead, attached to nothing in order to trick the fish, right? So skating is that nice, gradual, sustained movement across the surface. Then let me define the other way to fish a caddis fly, which would be, say, to skitter or twitch, which would be kind of maybe more a sporadic movement on the surface of the water with pauses in between. So kind of tying that all together, I'll come back to that question that I get asked a lot in terms of fishing a caddis dry fly specifically, dead drift versus skating, movement. So I think it's situational depending. I think that when you are fishing to a, a fish, like specifically on the Yakima in central Washington, this is the first river that comes to my mind when I'm thinking of this situation, the fish will be pushed way up into the banks and you're fishing literally a foot by foot section of river of where those fish are feeding. So a lot of times we fish from a boat on anchor and you literally can make the same cast 30 times in this tiny, call it a dinner size plate area of a fish that is consistently feeding. So you don't necessarily really have time to even get a dead drift, let alone skate a fly because you have to put it in such a specific lane for those fish to eat. Um, so then skating, I would say, in again, situational depending, um, skating is a very specific, you obviously can't skate a dry fly in a very tight, tight, narrow spot in the bank. So skating is kind of a great way to kind of cover a lot of water and to get some fish to move to your fly. But if you are a newbie and you're looking to get some fish on a caddis fly, I would say start with a dead drift and if fish don't respond to it and you really need to get it to move or if you have the room to do so, then try skating a dry fly if dead drifting doesn't work. Then I'd love to talk about some of my favorite patterns here or at least specifically one just for that purpose. So this is the Umqua Never Sink caddis pattern. I love this thing. Uh, whether I'm fishing, you know, tied in on the bank or skating it, this is one of the most effective caddis patterns I have ever used. And I love that it has a foam head. So when skating it, it actually gives you, I don't know if you guys can see that very well, it actually gives you a great skate on the head because that foam pushes water more than say just elk hair caddis would like on a traditional pattern. And two, 
especially when fishing in low light conditions, late evening and such. That bright pink, that indicator makes it much easier to see when skating or fishing uh, a caddis pattern late in the evening makes it a lot easier. And in terms of, I'll kind of come back to, just kind of keep talking till more questions come in, but in terms of uh, here in Western Montana, you know, I would say our caddis hatches in chronological order, and this is really indicative of a lot of Montana. Um, you know, we would kick the season off our caddis hatch with the Mother's Day hatch, which generally comes in early May and goes through, say, mid-June. Uh, Mother's Day hatch, they're generally, uh, again, a size 16. They're black uh, or dark colored body. Um, and so from that, then we come into, we essentially have four main hatches here in Western Montana. Um, from that, we come into the just general tan caddis, which start to appear in late June and run all the way through mid-August. And then in one specific drainage, we do get traveling sedge or uh, the pattern that's often referred to is uh, Goddard caddis. And I would love to talk more about that. Those show up on a specific still water here in Montana when they're super fun to fish uh, come, we'll call it mid, mid July through mid to late July through August. And then kind of the fourth one that we have uh, here in Montana, and I'll show you that Goddard caddis. The fourth hatch that we have here in Western Montana, but this is the traveling sedge Goddard, Goddard caddis that shows up here. And I'll talk more about this. I'll come back to it because there's a lot to talk about. But <laughs> uh, then the fourth hatch that we come into uh, to tie the, the whole season together uh, are the October caddis, which show up in about mid-September and run through, we'll call it late October, weather depending, because we can get snow here <laughs> very soon. But I'll show you just quickly that October caddis. And again, I'll come back to some of these and touch on and provide more information on how to fish them and why. So I have another question. Do fish feed a higher percentage on emerging caddis versus egg laying or adult? How do you approach the difference? How might that be? So great question. Let me break that down. That's kind of a, how may they be identified? Awesome. Okay. So that's a multi-layered question. So I'm going to approach this question from time of day. So again, thinking that caddis are predominantly nocturnal. Fish are, and it, fish are going to become more active on adult caddis towards the evening and into the twilight hours. So emerging caddis. So I would take it from the day. So earlier in the day, yes, there are caddis in the system. Yes, fish are going to feed on them. No question. So I would, if I wanted to fish a caddis hatch from start to finish, I would start with an emerger and I would fish that kind of mid midday. So emerging caddis, you know, for that, I would fish a beadhead October pupa. And so that's going to be subsurface because yes, caddis will be active subsurface early in the day. So by fishing that, you can throw a dry dropper, you can nymph it, heck, you could even swing it if you'd like. So that then getting into the egg laying stage or adult stage, and how might you approach the differences and how might they be identified? So egg laying, again, the adults are going to become more active towards the end of the day. So that's when I would start to look for fishing um, an emerger, whether it's a pupa, a larvae, start transitioning into that adult, that dry fly. 
So, and again, you can start looking for, you'll start seeing fish become more active on the surface. And generally the hatch, I would say starts um, with smaller fish, more willingly feeding. And then as the evening comes, it tends to be, or from what I have seen, bigger fish then start to feed. So fish feed on a higher percentage. Um, I can't necessarily give or quantify percentage wise of what they would feed on, but I guess for giving you a tip on how to approach and how to fish the caddis hatch throughout the entire day would be start with that emerger, emerger that pupa or larvae stage, and then transition as the, the day transitions into the evening, then I would start fishing a an adult, um, an egg layer, so to speak. Uh, adults, again, will live in the water. They essentially swim up to the surface. Then they will spend about, I think I, I wrote it down here, uh, in pupa or resting stage, they'll encase themselves for about two to five weeks. And then when adults hatch, they are sexually mature and they will sit on the riverbanks and they actually, fun fact, they actually are herbivores. So they will feed and drink water in their adult stages. Unlike say mayflies, which tend to, from what I have read, die from dehydration. So they have a very short lifespan. So when those adult male and female caddis are on the banks, you'll see them start to then migrate into or towards the water. And the females then, as we see kind of dancing caddis, those are females starting to lay their eggs. And so that's kind of the full life cycle. Caddis are really neat in the sense that they have a complete life cycle. So they go from eggs to larva to pupa to adult. So they have a very complex life system and they're a really awesome bug. So another question, when matching the hatch, they say shape, size, color. Which of those do you find to be most important when picking flies to match the hatch? Whew, another, another great question. Um, the first thing I would say my gut reaction to that would be size and specifically talking about October caddis. So we get a, we get a great hatch of October caddis here in Western Montana. Uh, my favorite river to fish around here during that time, which is again, mid September to October. And I'll give you that pattern here again. It, the Blackfoot is awesome. We have a ton of October caddis. So you saw how big that October caddis is. In comparison, you know, you're talking a size eight. In comparison then to a, we'll call it a tan caddis. So there's a, there's a large size discrepancy between those. So that's kind of my first gut reaction would be size. Uh, again, most caddis outside of traveling sedge and October caddis for us here in Western Montana are on average, I would say a size 16. So if you're hucking a, an October caddis out <laughs> when it's Mother's Day caddis time, you might not have the best success. So I would start with size first. Um, shape, you know, that's a, that's a tough but easy question, I guess, or a layer of it to answer. Again, thinking of caddis and how they are built, they have that tent wing, so down wing versus up wing, like a mayfly. So with that down wing, moth-like appearance and the two antennae, shape is pretty easy to mimic. And lastly then, color. Yes, I do think color does matter. Uh, so again, thinking for us here in Western Montana, the Mother's Day hatch tends to be a little bit darker, uh, either black or olive, then versus our tan caddis hatch that we get kind of throughout the summer. And those tend to be much lighter in color and in body. So I would approach it from size, then color, and shape is, is relatively easy to, to get. So I, in that order. <laughs> For the adults, what treatment do you use to float them? Great question. So a lot of 
you know, patterns uh, with dry flies, you'll see if they have CDC on them, uh, certainly do not use any sort of um, flyagra with CDC or anything like that because it'll disintegrate that, that very fine material. But I really love, so I actually have three things that I love in terms of floatant. Uh, so right out of the gate, uh, this is, you can use CDC with this. This is very eco-friendly, great, this dry shake. I absolutely love it. It's liquid. Um, that's a great way when you first tie on a dry, get it liquid, get it in the liquid and it'll float. But then say you're fishing and you're catching fish and your dry fly isn't floating as well as it should. Then this is where that, I love this dry shake comes into play. Uh, not only does it dry your fly, but it also helps coat it again. And so then too, with more of like a, I don't use, I use this personally. I don't use this necessarily on a guide uh, perspective because I go through floating so fast, but I really love this uh, for my small, delicate dry flies, uh, whether I'm fishing a caddis, mayfly, what have you. And this is a brush in the mechanism of it. And this is wonderful uh, to have more of like a, a delicate uh, dipping versus, you know, a dunk. But these are great. I love this system. Uh, it helps It helps extend the, the life of your dry fly and really helps get that presentation and keep your fly on the surface, certainly. So I'll come back. Oh, perfect. For selective trout, what is your go-to pattern and why? Oh, great question. I am going to come back to this never sink. I love this thing. Again, the foam head on it helps keep it buoyant and hydrophobic. And when you're fishing a caddis pattern, again, it's generally towards the evening. So that high visibility for me makes all the difference. And selective trout. So I really love the body on this. I think it's one of the most universal yet specific adaptable patterns that I have found for caddis. I would highly recommend this if you have a very selective trout. Um, I believe this is a size 16 in my hand here. And this is definitely my go-to pattern, no matter if I'm fishing the Yakima in central Washington or my home waters on the Missouri out of Craig. This is my pattern that I would absolutely go to for a dry fly. No questions coming through. Oh, perfect. Talk about those patterns. Yeah, got it. So the patterns I wanted to touch back on are, there's two. So, and this is more so the application of fishing them and the patterns themselves. So I want to come back first to that traveling sedge. Sorry, I'll hold that up better. Traveling sedge or the Goddard caddis. Uh, traveling sedge for us here in Western Montana, we have one lake that is absolutely prolific in terms of a, a caddis fishery. Uh, it's Georgetown Lake. It's beautiful. Uh, it's set at the base of the Pintler Mountains and it is spring fed. There's cruising rainbows. They're super healthy. There's a population of brook trout, which actually is one of the few that we have, strongholds that we have in Western Montana. And there are some kokanee salmon in this lake. But anyways, the traveling sedge, the caddis itself is really a neat pattern to fish, the Goddard caddis, because traveling sedge in their adult life will actually come back to the water and they run on the surface of the water to deposit their eggs. So they're very, coming back to that word again, animated. So this is where you'll see a lot of skating, twitching, skittering, so to speak, on the surface of the water. You want to give these flies a lot of movement. Uh, and it's a really fun, really fun hatch to fish um, on Georgetown Lake. I love it when there's a little bit of chop on the water because it actually allows, the. F I think it allows your caddis to skitter even more naturally kind of on the, the breaks of the, the waves on the surface of the water. Um, so traveling sedge is super fun. I highly recommend if you can get out and fish it. It is just a hoot with that Goddard caddis pattern. The second fly, or excuse me, I should say 
specific caddis I want to come back to is that October caddis. Um, again, for us here in Western Montana, you know, unless we go to east of the divide to the Missouri to a tailwater, we experience runoff here in Western Montana. So a lot of times come that Mother's Day timing in May, our rivers are blown out. So it's a little bit difficult to fish a, fish a hatch when our rivers are chocolate milk. Nevertheless, I would say my favorite pattern or hatch to fish here in Western Montana is on the Blackfoot with an October caddis. Uh, October caddis are the biggest of the caddis that we have out here in hatching. And they come just at a very pivotal time for us, our trout here. They're, they start to hatch in mid-September and go through mid-October and trout absolutely love them. Uh, it's a huge food source that for them to pack on some extra pounds before the winter comes. And I love the application of fishing October caddis. You can get away with just a broad tight line swing through and fish will come out of the deep for them and it is awesome. Um, so in terms of that, but that's a dry fly. You can absolutely dead drift a dry fly. For us here, we fish out of a boat. You know, I guide out of a boat 99, if not 100% of the time. So you're able to fish a, an October caddis as a single dry fly. You can run a little dropper below it, uh, depending on how how big your, your October caddis dry fly pattern is, but a great subsurface bug for a dry dropper for us here in Western Montana, specifically kind of during the October caddis hatch. Um, I love these Jaeger soft hackle jays. Um, a lot of folks might know it in Washington as a YBs. This in terms of a, a dropper for caddis is phenomenal. I love this thing. It's tungsten, it's hairsier, it's delicious. It's of course, doesn't necessarily stack up to the size of an, um, an October caddis pupa, but for any other hatch during the caddis hatch, this is an exceptional, exceptional subsurface fly. But coming back to that October caddis, you know, you can dead drift it, skate it, all of that. Um, this is kind of one hack that I've learned over the years with fishing and loving the October caddis hatch, especially on freestone rivers and such. Um, and this is unconventional, but it works. Uh, I love to take a size four Pat's rubber legs and snip the abdomen or the body legs off, snip them really short, leave these antennae long because again, caddis have very long front antennae. And I love to just trim it down. And you know, as simple as a rubber legs is, this thing works. It's the size of an October caddis uh, pupa and larvae. And I love it. You can get away with just the simplicity of swinging it through. Um, I love swinging a trout spay, especially during caddis hatches. Uh, super fun way to get them. And so this on the swing looks just like a large October caddis pupa, as weird as that sounds, because it's a stone fly. <laughs> but it does look very similar. Um, if you see the the caddis, the larvae, they look much like a worm or a caterpillar. So I think that's kind of where you can have that crossover between stonefly nymph is now a caddis larvae. It's pretty great. Awesome, keep the questions coming. These are great. Do you see an aggressive take? or sipping take from trout on adult caddis? And how do you approach the hook set? Great question. So aggressive take versus a sipping take. Generally with caddis, I would say it's gonna be more aggressive than it is sipping, like say on a mayfly, uh, which is awesome. And hook set wise with that said, Sometimes they set the hook on themselves, to be completely honest. I mean, if it's a, an aggressive enough take, you don't, before it all comes together, you're already hooked up and your rod tip comes up. <laughs> but with an aggressive take, you know, especially if you're fishing um, like four or five X uh, with those takes, 
Um, you know, you want to ensure that you're not going to snap them off when, when coming up. But just a nice, I would say, approach the hook set. When in doubt, always comes straight up for me. Uh, of course, trout, you know, you'll have heartbreak. Sometimes trout have crazy behavior where they eat going downstream and you set and you miss or, um, you know, they swirl on it and, and eat it as it's going down or whatnot. There's always the, the element that the hook set won't come together. But with an aggressive take, generally, just coming up with that raw tip straight up, you're going to get them. I say that. Mm, memorable caddis hatch. You know, so I've, I have two, I'll make them quick. Um, I would say, so most recently for me, it's not even necessarily the hatch, but it was the fish and the bug. So I was in Eastern Washington last fall and I was skating for skating dry flies for steelhead. And so I was able to fish, you know, a big, even bigger than what I have here for trout, uh, a big old October caddis for uh, steelhead. And I was in a, a beautiful quintessential run. You know, you have the head, you, then you have the body of the run and the tail out. And the, the body of the run was super deep and it was up against this beautiful rock wall. And I saw a fish boil. So I knew it was game on. So I got my, my floating tip on my setup and I built my leader out and I had my dry fly. And I was able to swing, tight line swing my October caddis through. I rose the fish once and it boiled so aggressively on my fly that it actually pushed it out of the way as it was trying to eat it. So I was able then to get another cast out and I swung through the second time and it was just the coolest eat. I just saw head, shoulders, knees, and toes of a steelhead. It was about eight or nine pounds, wild fish, came up and came down on my fly. And I didn't even have to set. I mean, you don't normally have to set when you're swinging a dry fly, but I mean, that thing, I didn't even have to lift the rod. It was already hooked. Um, so that's like most memorable or I guess most recent. Uh, but really when I started to fall in love with caddis and to fish that hatch, uh, I I'm from Helena. So growing up, you know, fishing the Missouri, uh, I remember I had just gotten my driver's license and I was pretty inexperienced or I was still learning how to fly fish and it was all self-taught. And I went up and the caddis were popping one evening and I was by myself and knowing the very little that I did at the time, I pieced it all together and I was able to land an absolutely gorgeous rainbow on my first cast of piecing this whole thing all together. Uh, and it was really neat because I was actually able to skate the fly through and it ate it on the, the skate. So um, that was definitely a, a very memorable uh, memory and event for me. And it was awesome. I'll never forget that. Awesome. So yes, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks for all the great questions. Uh, I hope that I could answer some and maybe piece some uh, some things together for you in terms from the, the rigging side and then the approach and maybe talking a little bit more uh, about the actual patterns themselves. Uh, again, I am Kinsley Scott. I am based out of Missoula, Montana. And if you guys wanna come out and fish, uh, maybe for October caddis here this year, because that's our next hatch coming up. Uh, check out MissoulaMontanaFlyFishing.com. You can find me there. Thank you guys so much again for joining me. I hope this helps.